Morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me uh, through the room? All the way in the back. Thanks for being patient for a little delayed takeoff here. Um, we certainly wanted to make sure we had the opportunity to uh, draw blood from everyone who was kind enough uh, to participate in our uh, blood draw uh, this morning. We'll have a little bit more time this afternoon if uh, anyone out there uh, didn't get the opportunity yet. First and foremost, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, first regional NMO patient day here at the University of Colorado. Uh, we really are excited to see so many patients, family members, caregivers, significant others here today. Um, this is an inaugural event and we're very grateful to the volunteers, uh, to the people who are speaking, uh, to the lab personnel outside and to all the other uh, advocates who have donated their time for this event, as well as uh, the Guthie Jackson Charitable Foundation for their generous uh, support and assistance. Neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, is a rare or orphan disease, as we call it. One main goal of today's activities is to dispel any connection between rare and isolated, between orphan and alone. At the end of the day, we want you to be educated and empowered, but more importantly, we want you to realize that you're not alone in this fight. When you look around this room, not only do you see others around you with the same condition, but you have physicians, healthcare personnel, researchers, and advocates who are dedicated towards helping you fight this disorder and search for a cure. We have a full schedule today designed to inform and educate you on a variety of topics. My colleagues from the University of Colorado Neuroimmunology Group will review our current understanding and treatment of adult and pediatric NMO and introduce you to state-of-the-art techniques to enhance functioning following neurologic injury. I have the opportunity to talk to you about the latest in clinical and uh, basic research in NMO, and then following these talks, we'll have a big panel for you to ask uh, any questions, as well as a brief question and answer time following each talk. In the afternoon, we'll have some advocacy time, some time for you to learn about uh, nutrition, and some time for you to uh, learn about disability and other resources available to you. In total, I'm looking forward to an exciting day that I hope will both inform and inspire you. And to get us started today, we have uh, Dr. Enrique Alvarez, who is a graduate of the University of Colorado Medical School and a uh, graduate of our uh, graduate school here in the Department of Neuroscience. He has a master's in clinical investigation from Washington University, and he completed his fellowship in neuroimmunology uh, at the um, Washington uh, University in St. Louis. And so it's a pleasure to have him here. He is uh, taking care of a number of uh, MS and NMO patients and with other neuroimmunologic disorders. So uh, please uh, help me in welcoming him in to talk to you about adult NMO. Great. Well, thanks. Everybody hear me up there in the back? Perfect. Awesome. So um, I just wanted to kind of start off a little bit with some uh, basic uh, basics. So uh, if we talk about NMO and neuromyelitis optica, we are basically going to try and break that down a little bit. So what does that mean? So neuro, just to talk about the nerves, nervous system. Milo, uh, basically talking about the spinal cord. Itis is just inflammation. Optica relates to the eyes or vision. So the hallmark, as many of you know already, is that it involves sort of long spine lesions and, which is a little bit hard to see, oh, let me go back here, let me see if I can point a, get the pointer, there we go, you can see kind of a long lesion here in the spinal cord, you can see effect of the optic nerve there with a little bit more signal on this side than on this other side. So uh, just a little bit of basic numbers. Uh, so basically it can affect people anywhere from childhood all the way to late adulthood. 
uh, we see sort of a predominance of women over men. Uh, six to one is probably even conservative. Uh, and a lot of patients will also have other autoimmune conditions associated with this. Uh, particularly, we see a lot of lupus, Sjogren's, or some of the, the rheumatologic type conditions, and, and some overlap with, uh, with those conditions. Uh, as far as being a rare disease, we talk about sort of 4,000 patients in the United States, about four out of 100,000. So definitely kind of a, a unique subset of people um, as we tend to think about. And the issue about sort of Asians, African Americans, maybe having a little bit more likelihood of developing NMO, this is something that just kind of really just relates a little bit as to uh, what country you're in, I think, things like this, and how likely or how common other uh, demyelinating conditions can be, such as MS and things like that. So what kind of symptoms do we look at and, uh, and can normally see in an uh, NMO patients? So again, if we think about lesions in the spinal cord and basically sort of the big processing center being up here in the brain, and sort of every most of that goes out to, communication-wise, that goes out to the rest of the body, goes through this interstate system, the spinal cord, and it kind of ends up being kind of like this. So things can sometimes make it into that, sometimes they make it through, and sometimes they don't. Uh, and when they don't, and how much and what gets affected, the some links can make it through or not, the symptoms that we uh, typically would start thinking about would be numbness, uh, weakness, problems with bowel, bladder, and sexual. Uh, Lermites, a lot of you have probably heard about or had, and that's that electric sensation that can go down your spine, it can go into the arms, legs, and particularly, especially with flexing or kind of bending down the neck. Uh, paroxysmal tonic spasms, these are involuntary spasms that can happen. Uh, kind of send shock waves a little bit to parts of the body. You can see increased reflexes, so when we tap on the knees and things like that, that's part of what we're looking for. Dr. Bennett knows a lot more about this than all of us, um, but basically what are we looking for as far as visual type symptoms? So if your eyes are involved, you may not make it down the chart very as much as you might have before. You might lose some color perception. And so instead of being kind of bright reds, the, the reds might become dulled out. You might lose vision or you might develop sort of a blind spot. And the things that we look for are changes in the back of the eye. And as the optic nerve comes in to the back. And your eyes may not shrink as much as they normally would when you shine a light at them. So just because we have transverse myelitis and optic neuritis or inflammation of the optic nerve, doesn't necessarily mean that you have an MO. There's a lot of other things that we look at to try and sort out that is this an MO or is this one of these other related conditions that can sometimes happen. You can see the list is very long. There'll be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> um, but this is why we try to sort out the history so carefully. We might get a lot of tests. You might have a spinal tap. You might have blood tests, uh, vision tests, uh, and things like that to try and help sort out these things. So a little bit about the history. We've known about NMO to some extent. There's been case reports going back as early as probably the early, early 1800s. Uh, Dr. Albright in 1870 kind of started, uh, recognized uh, that there was a link between spinal cord and vision issues. Um, in, uh, 19, in 1880, Dr. Erb provided sort of the first description of somebody who presented with the combination of symptoms of the transverse myelitis and um, problems with the optic nerve, with vision problems. And then Dr. DeVick in 1894 uh, presented 16 cases uh, that kind of had the same pattern. Uh, so a lot of times we might talk about neuromyelitis optica. We're trying to get away from calling diseases by people's names, but you may hear DeVick's disease, um, and that's the reason why. So early on, this was always sort of thought to be a variant of MS. Um, and trying to kind of start to tease out a little bit what the differences were, what this variant really constituted, how is it similar, how is it different. And so uh, some criteria, and you can start noticing that not much change until uh, when, when some of these changes started to happen in 1990. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to kind of keep track about how fast our knowledge has really kind of gone through for uh, NML. 
Again, another quiz on this afterwards. But the main criteria for this was, again, the optic neuritis, so eye involvement, acute myelitis, so basically problems with the spinal cord. And then we were trying to kind of get away from having any other brain problems so that we could try to separate away from MS. And so you can see that one of the main criteria that we were looking for is that you couldn't have things that look like MS. So again, other kind of criteria that we were starting to look at is that the brain MRI was uh, fairly unremarkable and particularly did not look like MS. <coughs> the other thing we noticed in the spinal cord is that the lesions were long. So what do we call long versus short? We kind of use number of spine levels. And so if you're longer than three, you can see one, two, three here. So definitely spanning well beyond that. That's a little bit more consistent with what we see in NMO and less likely with that we in MS. In MS, one or two segments is a lot more typical. Much longer than two, we start to get a little bit suspicious that we're starting to talk about in the moment. The other thing is you tend to see a lot of cells in the spinal fluid. If the both eyes are involved versus just one eye. And then the other thing is sort of the severity. So MS patients, especially at the beginning, again, kind of big spectrum is a thing, but kind of early on, we really we expect that people are going to recover fairly well. And we're trying to separate that out because especially early in NMO, we would see that people may not necessarily recover from those attacks very well with the treatments that we're using. So that kind of started to kind of say, maybe we have to look at something different so to try and separate things out a little bit more so. Sorry. Uh, we started to notice that there were some differences um, as to what parts of the brain were affected. Um, and so in spinal cord, we could see that, um, excuse me, that particularly the central part of the spinal cord is affected. There are certain types of uh, cells that we would see in the pathology. These kind of reddish cells are uh, not commonly seen in a lot of the other uh, conditions such as MS. And people kind of were, were starting to kind of separate the pathology, look at, at different types of cells. The blood vessels look a little bit different in NMO compared to MS and other conditions. These two particularly kind of stood out as well. So this kind of was starting to suggest that antibody levels and, and something, a marker of complement, that, the, that these things were a little bit different than what we normally would see in MS in that second line. And so that kind of then led to start saying, hey, maybe there's an antibody that's specific in NMO. And they took some blood and put it on slices, and there you'd see some of the staining. Um, and so there was very specific, everything wasn't lighting up or things like that. Um, and um, when they looked at trying to see what was being expressed in MS versus other conditions, uh, there was a lot more patients with NMO that had uh, the sand body than in other conditions. They were able to kind of feel out that this antibody, so they're just being able to call it NMO, kind of had an expression pattern that looked like aquaporin 4, just in the a protein, but it allowed, allowed us to start saying maybe why the lesions where they're at and things like that. And so these were some of the experiments that they were showing, so they're basically very specifically showing that. With this antibody, then, they allowed us to start saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of these patients that look like NMO who have brain lesions. Maybe some of these patients with brain lesions really do have NMO and we can't separate them out. So it's kind of one of those things where as you learn a little bit more, then you can kind of learn more about other things. And we start to see that, you know, these pati patients with NMO do have brain lesions, that these lesions look different from MS lesions. And they kind of fit other patterns. You can see lesions that are really big, lesions that are kind of centered sort of in that middle part of the brain. Um, and again, kind of just have a different shape from what we would see in MS. So that led to sort of new criteria in 2006, and again, highlighting that you, the optic neuritis and myelitis, but we started to incorporate things such as that antibody. We started to kind of be able to say, well, you can have MRI changes that just can't look like MS. Um, and then Dr. <coughs> Bennett's going to tell you about even some new changes that have happened as we've learned more about this. <coughs> but what does this antibody mean? Is this a problem antibody? Is it causing the disease? Um, and so we see that as the number of spine segments go up, uh, the amount of antibody goes up, that as you treat with steroids, that the antibody levels go down. So 
at least some food for thought um, that maybe you know this antibody might be causing or be part of the problem. So as far as treatment go, I mentioned that treatments can decrease things, uh, some of the antibody levels. And so um, the way I kind of try to think about it is uh, problem uh, treatments for early when somebody has a relapse or things that you try to do sort of in the long term to try and reduce a uh, number of attacks. And so the first thing and the main thing that we often will go to is steroids. I think most of our patients probably have had rounds of steroids. Uh, usually we go with something IV. Usually we go with sort of longer courses in NMO than in MS patients. Methylprednisolone is a common option that we will do. Five days is something that we usually kind of duration that we look at, but this can be variable. We use this to create decreased inflammation. Um, and there's a variety of things that we worry about and why we always try to limit and balance sort of the effects versus how much we're going to do. So if we can do two days and get away with it and it's the same effect as five days, why not try to do that? If it doesn't seem to be responding well to steroids, one of the things we would probably look at then is something called plasmapheresis. This is something similar to dialysis. They take your blood and put it through a machine to kind of wash out some of these antibodies or some of these components. Um, we see sometimes problems with clots, infections, <coughs> low blood pressures as, as your blood kind of goes into this machine. So that's why we don't necessarily jump to this, uh, but it's something that's an option. <coughs> Uh, for very severe attacks, you sometimes will do chemo type compounds to try and uh, get things in the immune system to kind of behave the way we want a little bit better. A lot of times then we do the big steroids. We might sort of transition into doing sort of a daily oral steroid, something that's kind of low dose, help kind of control things a little bit more so. Uh, we particularly need to do that if the drug that we pick long term is a drug that takes a while to kick in. And so the first two drugs on this list, Inuran and Celsep, are two of those drugs that can take several months to kick in. So you might see sort of when you balance out the steroids uh, compared to uh, trying to get rid of those steroids. Rituximab is a uh, medicine that kicks in a little bit faster. We still try to overlap that a little bit, maybe not as long as the other two medicines. And then the next few slides, I kind of go through these drugs a little bit just to kind of give you an introduction. Um, they're a little bit busy slide, but uh, wanted to kind of provide a little bit of why we pick one drug versus another drug and that kind of stuff. So, Imran basically inhibits cells from dividing quickly. So, in, in inflammation, cells that are trying to cause that inflammation are dividing very fast. And so, if we can limit that, that tends to be sort of a good thing. Um, the dose is for this medicine is, is a little bit tricky because some people don't have the enzyme that helps break it down, and so that's something that we need to check, but in particular in the past, it would be something that people could get toxic if we just started the normal dose that everybody would normally get. And so as we've learned, this is an enzyme that really has only become available in the last several years, and so something that we're now able to kind of check that enzyme and start at a dose that's a little bit higher than maybe we would in the past. The only problem is that blood cells in the, aren't the only cells that divide fast. The, the, uh, the cells in the gut also divide fairly fast, and so you can get a lot of GI upsets and, and things like this. I'm going to introduce these plots as far as showing the effect that these medicines have. So these are sort of little, each line is a patient. These little symbols represent sort of an attack, and you can see at this vertical line when the drug was introduced. So you can see a lot of dots and after treatment, maybe fewer attacks. So in 99 patients that was looking at this series that were followed for almost two years, what was the effect of this? Well, 38 had to stop for side effects. So you can see that the drugs maybe aren't necessarily greatly tolerated. There's a little bit of concern for formation of cancer. So three of these patients, so 3% almost, basically had developed a cancer on this medicine. But the rate reduction, or the number of attacks per year, went from 2.2 before treatment to 0.8 at the lower doses, and even lower if we can get you up to those higher doses. So fairly decent effect uh, with some of these medicines. And about a third of the patients really did great on this medicine. 
Cell step kind of works very similar. Uh, we can start this, we don't have that concern with the enzyme that breaks it down, so we can start a little bit faster, but again, you still have a lot of GI problems. When we look at the effectiveness of this medicine, you can kind of see the vertical line should line up about here. And in this series of 24 patients that were followed for a little bit over six, uh, for two years, sorry, six had to stop because of these side effects, usually kind of GI problems or problems with labs. And this, these patients weren't as sick. They only had about 1.3 attacks per year, but they did really well. And most of the patients did really made it through without a lot of relapses. Only 8% really had more of an increase in disability uh, compared. Uh, and so, so usually, so this would kind of suggest that at least maybe that maybe this is just a little bit of a stronger medicine. Uh, Rituximab is a medicine that I think is probably our favorite drug, at least I know for me and I think for a lot of people here. Um, and so this cell knocks out part of the immune system, specifically something called B cells, cells that express this marker CD20, which is what the antibody recognizes. And so um, it's dosed in usually every six months, and how we dose it kind of varies a little bit, just depending on how people have been doing and what their labs look and things like this. We worry a little bit about um, infusion reactions, about infections. Um, in this series, particularly, so there was 30 patients that were followed for almost five years, so some fairly long data that we actually started to kind of be able to collect. Again, just remember the new criteria when it came out in 2006. Um, but the rate before was 2.4, and we dropped it to 0 0.3. So again, it's suggesting pretty effectiveness, good effectiveness of this medicine. Only 7% had an increase in their disability during this long period of time with this medicine. And I'll finish off with this, but why is it so important to separate this condition now from MS? I mean, we've been talking about it and trying to separate it out. And this is a perfect example of why that's, that might be the case. So all these medicines I mentioned were not medicines that we often will do or treat MS with. Rituximab might be the one exception for that. But one of the medicines that we use a lot for MS interferons has kind of the opposite effect for MMO. And you can see that there's a fair number of markers before treatment with interferons, but instead of kind of clearing out that this gets worse. And what you can see is that interferons which are often used again for MS, increase in almost nearly double the rate of relapses um, per year uh, compared to not treated. So it's very important to get the right diagnosis so we can get the right treatment. Uh, so a little bit of a taste about different treatments in NMO and a little background, and I'll turn it over to uh, Terry, uh, uh, who is uh, going to tell us about, about pediatric NMO. While we're switching the mics off, and I sh I'll get to a mic just in case. While they're switching the microphone there, uh, we'll have a chance to get some uh, question and answers in after uh, Dr. Schreiner finishes her talk and before we have the first coffee break. Uh, let me take the opportunity to introduce uh, Terry Schreiner, who is Assistant Professor of uh, Neurology at the University of Colorado and a specialist in uh, pediatric neuroimmunologic diseases. Uh, Terry received her uh, BA in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and her master's in health policy from Yale University and her MD from the Rochester School of Medicine. She then came uh, here to Colorado to do her pediatric neurology, stayed on board with us to do a neuroimmunology uh, fellowship and uh, particularly specializing in uh, pediatric uh, neuroimmunologic disorders. Uh, Dr. Schreiner and I share a number of uh, pediatric NMO patients, and I wanted her to uh, uh, teach you about uh, the pediatric manifestations of NMO to give you an idea of how varied the presentations can be and the different considerations we have to have when uh, treating children and recognizing uh, this disease in children. So I appreciate her being here and uh, uh, like to have you welcome her, just desired for her uh, important time. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bennett. 
Um, it is my pleasure to be here this morning to talk about uh, NMO in children, and I hope you'll indulge me playing with the title a little bit. Um, we're going to discuss finding Nemo as neuromyelitis optica in children. And we'll um, go briefly through this outline. You've um, heard a number of things about NMO and no doubt know a lot already um, from personal experience and from Dr. Alvarez. So I'll try and focus specifically on how pediatric NMO differs from adult NMO in the areas of the diagnosis, particularly the challenges that come with diagnosing NMO in children, how we treat NMO, what the prognosis is when you're diagnosed in childhood, and I'll tell you a little bit about the patients that I see here at the University of Colorado and Children's Hospital. And briefly, we'll touch on future directions. So as Dr. Alvarez mentioned, we've um, thought about NMO as um, classically being a clinical presentation of optic neuritis and transverse myelitis, and then two of the other three things that you see listed here. An MRI that does not look like MS, a very long transverse myelitis, or a positive antibody. And the antibody I'll, I'll introduce just briefly because it becomes very important as we think about the diagnosis and also the, the pathology, what actually causes the damage in NMO. And this is an antibody that is produced in the body, gets into the brain, and attacks this thing called an aquaporin-4 water channel, which is a very common water channel in the brain. And um, by doing so, creates an inflammatory cascade that leads to damaging support cells called astrocytes, which then damages another cell, which then leads to destruction of the myelin around the nerves uh, uh, in our brain. So the new criteria that you'll hear more about from Dr. Bennett expand a little bit because what we've observed in clinical practice is that not everybody fits the prior diagnosis of you have to have optic neuritis, you have to have a myelitis, and then those other things. So the new criteria will be expanded to include other syndromes, other symptoms that we see in NMO to hopefully help us diagnose both children and adults more accurately. And we'll talk about what these are. And there will be a, uh, a schema so that if you have sort of more typical presentations, maybe two uh, of the above and an antibody, then your diagnosis is met, or two even without the antibody. So let's talk a little bit about pediatric NMO. This is very rare. We know that NMO in general is a rare disorder, but even more so in children. We see if we look at all um, kids presenting with demyelinating disease, only three or four percent of them will actually be diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica, making this a, a very rare disorder. Most children, when they present with NMO, are between the ages of 10 and 4 years old. There is a female predominance, which is similar to what we see in adulthood. As we see in adulthood, most cases are relapsing, and that is particularly true if you have the antibody. And there's a higher percentage of non-white populations affected, more so than what we see in pediatric MS, and that's a comparison that's often made, but also more than what we would see in adult NMO. We see that African Americans are disproportionately represented. We see Latin Americans, Asian Americans, um, Native Americans. So this is... Um, uh, one feature that when we have a diagnostic dilemma, we'll sometimes look to to help us, you know, maybe lend credence to the diagnosis. And um, as in other neuroimmune disorders, NMO in childhood can be triggered by a preceding infection or a vaccination. Clinically, what we see in children is that there may be a bilateral optic neuritis more often than what um, we would see in adults. One report showed 15% having bilateral, so both eyes involved at the same time. And though both adults and children 
will have lesions on their brain MRI commonly. What we see in childhood is that the children are more commonly symptomatic of those brain lesions. So they will have an altered awareness. Um, they'll either be confused or very fatigued. They'll have double vision. Um, if a um, part of the brain called the hypothalamus or the brainstem is involved, then we'll see hormone abnormalities. And we can see nausea, vomiting, or even persistent hiccups as a presentation um, of NMO. And in children, unlike adults, seizures are more common with these attacks. I'll touch just briefly on the genetics, and it's going to be brief because we don't know a lot about it yet, but what we've observed is that among um, families of a child with pediatric NMO, there's commonly a first degree relative who has an autoimmune disease. But rarely, very rarely, is that person also diagnosed with NMO. So you see there that familial cases of NMO, really 3% maybe, and of those cases reported, they're commonly sisters, and that's adult data. So, so we, we suspect there may be a genetic predisposition, but this is not a genetic disease. Testing for NMO in children is similar to that of adults. Um, I've introduced the antibody, and we know that if you have the antibody, you're, you have the disease. It's a very specific test for NMO. It doesn't capture all of the patients with the disease, so the sensitivity is not that high. But if you have the antibody, the, you have the disease, essentially. We know that the antibody indicates a relapsing course. Um, there you see one study reported 93% um, having a recurrent attack. And like adults in children, it's common to see other autoantibodies, so antibodies that are directed against the body, the self. And this is a table taken from one study that was reported, I think, by Mayo of about 75 children and listed are all of the different antibodies that were found in these serum samples, and 76% had at least one, if not more, other autoantibody among the children with NMO, though they didn't necessarily meet criteria for those other diseases. So this would maybe suggest that there is a, uh, a predisposition among immune systems to, to be overactive, to get confused and attack things that shouldn't, not just the aquaphor and for um, water channel. So among the MRI findings in children, we see about 70% have abnormalities in their brain. And as we've discussed already, the brain lesions tend to be more clinically apparent. So whereas adults have brain lesions, it may not be manifesting clinically in how they're doing. With children, it's very different. These, these lesions are commonly um, symptomatic. They cause problems. And the uh, tricky business with pediatric NMO is that it can look like other diseases of childhood, diseases that don't affect adults. For example, one called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, ADEM, which commonly will have a brain appearance of, whoops, wrong way, uh, here, the bottom two, there we go. The sort of diffuse bilateral sort of fluffy appearance can be very common among this other disorder. So we can't rely just on the MRI to help us differentiate these diseases. In the spinal cord, what we see in children is that the uh, very long transverse myelitis is not as specific for NMO. We see that in other things like the acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and even pediatric onset multiple sclerosis. So let's talk briefly about treatment. So my um, uh, protocol, I guess, my way of thinking is that this is an aggressive disease that creates disability with each attack. And so 
If you have one attack and a child has one attack and the antibody is negative, it's reasonable to observe to make sure you've got the right diagnosis because this would not, um, assuming the child did not meet criteria. But if you have even two attacks and it's kind of looking and smelling like NMO, I strongly recommend, or at least recommend considering treatment in these children. And of course, if the NMO antibody is positive, then uh, I say treatment is required based on what we know. And what we know is that for, I'm talking about long-term treatment here, you heard a little bit about acute treatment from Dr. Alvarez. For long-term treatment, chronic immunosuppression is the standard of care, and there are three drugs that have been used for that, azathioprine, mycophenolate, and rituximab. And we've used these without really understanding which one was better than the other historically. But as Dr. Alvarez mentioned, we recently have had some retrospective data. So investigators coming together to say, hey, in my center, we've had 90 patients um, with NMO, both adult and child, and we've looked back, and this is kind of how they've done. So the folks on rituximab, they had a reduced relapse rate of 82% or 88%. And then you see mycophenolate very close second and azathioprine um, uh, trailing in third, but still we would say effective. And Dr. Alvarez put more detail around that. Um, but this is uh, some of the only information that we have about which treatment might be best. Um, so far, though there will be more um, information coming. So let me tell you a little bit about the patients that I see here in Colorado. Over the last four to five years, I've seen 13 patients present um, with neuromyelitis optica less than 18 years old, seven of whom were antibody positive. And I say to date because of the six that meet the clinical criteria for NMO, or at least kind of look like it, um, I'm still testing them. I've had the experience and it's been reported that you need to continue to recheck as many as four or five times before the antibody becomes positive. And so surveillance in these children becomes very important. Uh, unlike the um, gender ratios reported, uh, my cohort has six boys and seven girls. The age of presentation has ranged between five and 18, the median of nine. Uh, only five or five children have had only one attack, but four of those five children are antibody positive and have begun treatment. And the treatment breakdown here, you'll see my bias um, towards rituximab um, is probably evident, and that's for a lot of reasons, including the ease of dosing. Uh, nobody likes to take a daily pill, particularly one that makes them feel lousy, and that's even more true if you're a child. So I think that rituximab, while it may be the most effective, is also the most convenient um, for children. So the prognosis of childhood onset NMO, we know a little bit about. This is one study that was published a couple of years ago, which showed that if you are diagnosed with NMO as a child, you're, uh, there's a longer interval after diagnosis to getting to a point where you need a cane or some other assistive device to walk. This is good. However, the time to severe vision loss, loss is much, much shorter in children. You can see 1.3 years among pediatric onset NMO compared to 11 years for adults. And we don't know much about neuromyelitis optica's cognitive effects in childhood. That remains to be seen. And I think it's important when talking about pediatric onset NMO, really to think about the fact that these are children existing within a system. Every, every patient has parents and adults have spouses, perhaps children, but, but when you're diagnosed with NMO as a child, it affects parents, it affects your sibling relationships, your friends, and also yourself, as you are still young and trying to figure out who you are in this world. That's something I try and be sensitive to, is that we don't want to um, uh, let this uh, define who these children are. 
So future directions, one, I think we need to understand better this thing called antibody negative NMO, and I think Dr. Bennett will talk more about that. I think that's particularly important in childhood where we see so often a child presenting with symptoms of NMO but having a negative antibody for one year, maybe even two years before they turn positive. We need to have treatment trials for both pediatric and adult NMO, and I'm very pleased that some of those are now getting underway. And because the disability of NMO comes with relapses, I think it's so important to try and find the biomarkers that would help us understand when a relapse is about to happen so that we might be able to act proactively to prevent that, that disability at the time or just before the attack. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm very pleased to have one of my patients in the audience today and he has his 10th birthday today. So. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ty. Happy birthday to you. Well, I viciously got us back on time. And uh, with that said, we have a coffee break coming up, but we have a brief opportunity for any quick questions for uh, Dr. Alvarez or Dr. Schreiner that anyone has. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and speak up. There are cards on the table if you wish to pass them uh, forward. But we'll take any quick questions in the next uh, few minutes, then go to the coffee break and come back for the next section. Okay. Uh, first, Doctor said that there was a very rare disease, 400,000, but then Matthew said that you have seen over 50%. Okay, so I think um, uh, I think let me let me give an opportunity to clarify. I was unclear. So, so this is a very rare disease, and well, I think the number I quoted was that three to four percent of all children with demyelinating episodes will have NMO. So demyelinating episodes in childhood are already pretty rare, 0.4 per 100,000 or so. And so 3% of that is a much, much smaller number. So um, so I don't know what I might have said that was 50%. Well, at the end there, he said 13, and then six, so that's not Okay. Okay. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, so I have 13 patients and the 13 patients clinically look like NMO. They meet the criteria of either optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or um, an MRI that doesn't look like MS, um, or a very long lesion, but they don't have the antibody. So of those that look like NMO but don't have the antibody, those are the ones that I'm continuing to track, continuing to test over time, because my clinical suspicion is that they're going to develop the antibody. Um, or that they might have a different antibody that's looking like NMO. Um, does that clarify? I don't know. I think you're. Why don't you find me later, and I'll try and I'll try and clarify. Where is the? I'm trying to work sorry, brain fog um, Where where is the NMO research at with regards to stem cells? Is that being looked at as an option, perhaps something that might help the Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I will be doing a talk on the research later, but I didn't include uh, anything on stem cells at this point. At, at this juncture, um, stem cell therapy, which is essentially at this point bone marrow transplantation, is being entertained as a last resort in some patients with NMO who failed all other forms of therapy. So bone marrow transplantation involves ablating all of your native immune system, and then of course having an appropriate uh, transplant uh, candidate who can provide you with a new immune system. 
And the early results show some efficacy, albeit the overall mortality rate, that is you will not survive the procedure with bone marrow transplantation can run in most good centers at about 5%. So the issue of having that extreme possibility of passing away because of the therapy makes it uh, very much a last resort. But it is something that we think, hey, if your immune system is programmed wrong, we'll just give you a new one. You know, that would be a good idea. Uh, we find out that obviously uh, for MS and for NMO, the damage that's been done certainly doesn't get repaired because of it. And uh, what we find is that there still are some patients who progress through because of uh, bad instruction sets that are given to the new immune system uh, that comes through that appears to be apparent in both. Now there's a second form of transplantation you may hear about in the future which is called mesenchymal uh, stem cell transplants. This isn't the same uh, thing. This is uh, a different set of cells that are given to you without uh, ablating the intrinsic immune system. It's being researched particularly right now in MS and not in NMO. It is meant to be a modulation or a change in your normal immune system and uh, that really hasn't taken a hold in any published fashion in the NMO field, so that can be uh, confusing sometimes. Just to put in a quick comment about that too, that if anybody's considering stem cell transplants, to make sure that it's considering that it is experimental, making sure that they go to a center that's very reputable, that they get included into a study that will look at that and not to pay $150,000 out of your own pocket to get something that's still very new. And there, there is a bone marrow uh, transplantation center, particularly at Northwestern, that has a clinical trial uh, going on that includes uh, NMO as well. Go ahead. Yeah, you'll have to wait for my talk and oh. we'll cover <laughs> SA237. <laughs> Yes, yes. So behavior changes are um, more commonly seen in NMO than they are in other demyelinating syndromes in the long term. So in the short term, this confusion behavior change that comes with the episode can be seen in multiple different demyelinating disorders. But with NMO and um, with personal experience here, we've seen that there can be significant and long-lasting behavior changes. And it uh, has to do with which part of the brain is affected by the attack. And the worst case scenario is you have you know, a, a behavior um, circuit in your brain. And if you happen to have a lesion in both sides, both hemispheres of your brain, in that behavior circuit, you really can have profound behavior change, personality change, and that can be long-lasting. So I'll do one more question, and then everybody can get up, stretch, use the facilities, etc. Uh, you said that uh, uh, the effect of the Oh, let me make sure I understand the question. So um, your question was about bilateral optic neuritis yeah. and it being more common in children. And um, the next part was, does treatment alter the outcome when it's bilateral? Okay. Yes, so optic neuritis can be bilateral in adults as well. Um, it's thought to be uh, maybe more common in the pediatric population to present with bilateral optic neuritis. But as you see in the, or saw in the one um, slide I presented, that was just 15% in one study. So it's not 
an overwhelming majority that present with bilateral optic neuritis. Um, we take it seriously because we know that time to severe residual vision loss in children is so short um, that that probably does make me think more about aggressive treatment. But every case is a little bit different and we need to make sure we know what's causing the bilateral optic neuritis first. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the prognosis could be Well, the prognosis we, we um, depends a lot on whether or not treatment is enacted early and whether or not future episodes are prevented. And so from the historic data, we know the time to vision loss is very short in children. And that was uh, data taken, you know, from up to 10 years ago to 2010, we're, we're sort of in a different phase now in our understanding that the disease is evolving. So I think the prognosis is guarded, but I'm optimistic um, that going forward we'll be able to preserve vision in these children. Okay, we'll return at 10.15 to start up uh, the next round of talks, so we'll see you back then. Okay. And then Dr. Uh, Dr. Hebert. Uh, get wired up first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Just one, one quick announcement. If there's anybody who still wants to have their blood drawn who hasn't had it drawn yet, uh, any patient, uh, please uh, proceed to the back and they can get those last blood draws done. We have a lot of processing to do on the blood. So, again, anybody interested in drawing blood, there's uh, still time right now. Thanks. Oh, I had it on you. Oh, thanks. I think, yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, no, not the audio.
Hi, I'm the same. Ali? Yes, I know. Would you like to talk from the podium or do you want to walk around? No, I need to move. Okie okay, doke. Thank you. Cheers. Actually, would you take the lanyard off? Yes. Yeah, we can talk about that. We did the, we fill out some stuff, but... Oh, Shake, rattle, and roll? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll talk to you. Okay, sir. Is that so... We're in on the middle click. Like, you to Thank you. Okay. Talk about where this comfortable place. Okay. Well, we're going to get started again, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hebert. Uh, Dr. Hebert uh, got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Exercise and Sports Medicine from the University of Wisconsin, and in 1997, his Master's in Physical Therapy and his PhD, subsequently in Clinical Science in 2009. He is uh, currently a principal investigator on uh, research grants involving uh, rehabilitation and physical therapy in demyelinating disorders. He also takes care of a number of our MS and NMO patients. And he's going to talk to you about enhancing function in NMO and emphasizing uh, rehabilitation and exercise. So uh, let me welcome uh, Dr. Hebert. OK, can you hear me? Great. Well, welcome back from the break. And first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Bennett for um, organizing this, as well as Ruth Johnson, if she's in the house, thank you so much for organizing this as well. She did a lot of work for this. And then Guthy Jackson, of course, the foundation for sponsoring. And then last but not least, for you attending and listening to us talk about the things that we really, really enjoy. So thank you so much for attending. OK, so this is just a really, this, I always put these up. I don't get paid by anybody in this room, including the uh, foundation, so I have no conflicts of interest. And so we're going to talk, obviously, about rehabilitation, but I will um, begin the full talk about exercise and movement and how important that is, not only to persons with neurological conditions, specifically NMO, but also just the general population. So it's not any different. So I always say to my patients, you are a person that just so happens to have X neurological condition. In your case, it would be X condition is NMO. So you are a person who is going to benefit from most of everything I say, whether you have a condition or not. But some of this is going to be maybe preventing further problems due to NMO, to restore function that NMO might have taken away, and then to obviously improve symptoms as well. So we talk about function and symptoms, and I just love this picture. This is actually in Sonoma, taking a hike, actually a run. And I came across this, and I just so happened to have my phone camera, and I'm like, this is perfect in the concept of don't let anything stand in your way. Obviously, they found this, and they just cut it right in half and said, screw it. We're going to have people walk right through it. That's what I want you to think about, these concepts of your problems, your function, your symptoms. Let's go ahead and let's take it head on. So there's not just physical therapists playing with the uh, concepts of rehabilitation. There's three important general spec uh, uh, components and categories. Physical therapy usually takes the leadership of rehabilitation overall. There's occupational therapy and speech therapy, um, and it all depends on the needs of the patient um, at hand. So this is not usually something that get, gets uh, prescribed right out of the gate. It's usually to the physical therapist and along with the fr frontline providers deciding what other entities of rehabilitation are important. And this is just a general breakdown of that. So like anything, it's very important to make sure that you've got everything in order. And if you put the cart in front of the horse and you say, okay, let's just jump into an exercise program, let's jump into something that I think is going to help me, but you don't have the guidance from a specialist, that's where things can go wrong and not only just uh, not work for you, but it could actually go wrong. So I think a really thorough examination by a rehabilitation specialist, and I'll get into a little bit of, you know, what does that mean, a specialist? Um, because not all, like any other practitioner in the healthcare field, not all physical therapists are made equal or created equally and uh, don't have the same experiences that someone like my, uh, myself have. So it's really important, obviously, for the neural exam examination to have all those tests that, yeah, that you have to do. You know, strength testing, sensory testing, all those physical tests. 
but also making sure that we have the overall complaints that you're bringing to the table as the patient, and then obviously your desires and your goals. Yeah, okay, I might get excited that your strength is starting to improve, but what does that help you with? What is it important? Why do we want to improve certain things in your life? That's what we have to understand first and foremost, are your desires as the patient coming into the clinic. And then um, obviously it's really important to classify uh, where you are on very um, standard um, materials and understanding of what you're bringing to the table in the clinic so that we can communicate to other practitioners too because we do see a lot of people from out of town and thus I have to communicate with other practitioners out in different networks and if we're not talking the same language this gets a little confusing. So my colleagues uh, including Dr. Vollmer who's the co-director of the MS Center we wrote a, um, a short uh, white paper on exercise. And yes, it has multiple sclerosis, but that's obviously a related disease. And so the overall con uh, conception of this white paper, which is just us talking of our, um, our expertise and not necessarily based 100% on evidence, but the importance of exercise, uh, exercise for the person with uh, MS, as well as bringing this to a person with MO. NMO. And my other colleague, um, Mr. Plato, he's not really a colleague, but anyways. <laughs> this is a quote, and if you look at it, I'm going to let you read it. I'm not going to read it for you, but I'm going to pull out some really key parts here. So destroying a good condition, a human being, and movement. So we're not talking about necessarily a prescribed exercise program, a prescribed rehabilitation program. This is an emphasis, and we really emphasize this in our, in our practice, is moving the importance of movement. So I will emphasize in the next few uh, slides the importance of exercise as a whole to not only to save your condition, but also to pervert, pre preserve it as long as you can. So there are different ways to be more active, quote unquote. And I leave that last uh, bullet point there but for the prescribed structured exercise program because it does not always have to be that case. And I'll talk a little bit about um, education, the importance of education. So believe it or not, I like to educate. So I educate my patients from the get-go. We get exercise, we get rehabilitation, we get some compensation components in the rehabilitation, but I think education is extremely important. It's the whys and the hows of what you're actually doing and the importance of that. So the exercise overall could be something that's integrated into leisure, recreational things, the fun things. The fun things you like to do could be characterized as an exercise program and can be something that can be very beneficial for you. If still employed or employed at all, occupation itself can be active and can be something that we work with. It's like, well, how can you be more active when you're at a desk job? I'll make sure that we find a way that you are while you're out of the house. And obviously a prescribed exercise structured program is obviously important. This title um, obviously is, is talking about um, the MS population overall. This is cited as MS because this is an MS literature. And so going to that point, MS literature, NMO literature in rehab and exercise, you can basically put those key terms in a search in some of our, our databases for evidence on rehabilitation, on physical therapy, on exercise, and it's probably like maybe five or six articles. It's very, very minimal in NMO to have evidence to support the things that we are doing in the clinic. So sometimes we do have to pull from the MS literature currently. Hopefully we can start building some of the literature and the evidence specifically in NMO. So let me highlight some of the things here. So enhancing and to reduce. So we talked about that in that first slide. How do we reduce some things, restore some things, and enhance some things with rehabilitation? And this particular slide is emphasizing exercise overall. So that's what we usually see is that, that left-hand column in the effects of rehabilitation and exercise. However, what we're starting to really emphasize and really excited about is what about the brain and central nervous system effects of exercise? And this is an um, article that comes out, um, you know, 2008, on MS, and we're still really no farther along in looking at this in humans. A lot of this information about growth hormones in the brain and central nervous system comes from some of our animal models. So hopefully we can bring this to uh, human subjects uh, quickly as, as possible, but really good evidence, hopefully. 
So in 2006, the band The Who, no, I'm just kidding. They, they didn't come up with this. So the World Health Organization is a uh, governing body for all the United Nations um, that uh, tells recommendations on various aspects of health-related components. And one of them is on rehabilitation. And I think this first bullet point is essential. Starting the rehabilitation process as soon as possible. This is a big push for me in my profession of rehabilitation is to bring this to the specialists of rehabilitation, but also the frontline providers, the neurologists, the, uh, the uh, physical assistants, uh, physician's assistants and, and PRAs, that we are really emphasizing this as soon as possible so that we can be ahead of the disability curve. So why do we want this to be as soon as possible? Reverse it to be more proactive rather than Recepting, receptive in saying, okay, we're going to react to whenever you have a advancement of your disease, that's when you come in and see your rehabilitation. I'm not saying that's not, it's too late. It's never too late, but it's really essential that we get this going as soon as possible. And then obviously that also plays into as much as you can brain health, spinal cord health, and making sure that that can be as protective as possible in as much evidence that we can support how much it can affect your, your brain and your spinal cord uh, through exercise. And so management and prevent any related and unrelated problems. So the unrelated problems are the uh, conditions that might be uh, obesity, might be uh, bone health, might be diabetes, other unrelated conditions that are, guess what, you are human and you are susceptible to other conditions too. But being less active, and having disability due to NMO can uh, accentuate that possibility of coming down with something that could, in and of itself, could lessen your lifespan just by uh, having an unrelated condition be worsened by not being more proactive about it. The second po uh, point of that statement in 2006, and I won't read it through that much, but um, I uh, will point out, you know, recognizing that rehabilitation efforts within the clinic itself we're seeing this really not becoming um, realistic, that we cannot sit as clinicians and sit in our whole little, our little box in the clinic and say, everybody come to us and then go out and do your own thing. Really needing to reach out and network with exercise specialists. So being able to maybe uh, work with exercise fitness in re uh, recreational centers and fitness clubs and looking at those individuals that we can actually coach as MS certified specialists, coach them, train them. As myself, I'm reaching out into the community, educating not only patients, but also educating clinicians and some of these other providers of exercise specialties out in the, in the, in the community so that it can be much more effective. And I always say, so it will stick. Whatever we emphasize in the clinic goes out and usually gets, unfortunately, because everybody's human, drops. And so the failure to follow up on that is a limitation in the current model of rehabilitation and sitting and throwing out from the clinic. I want to make sure that we're reaching out into your community, uh, back to this also, and possibly looking at, but there's a big cost to this, is true tele-rehabilitation. So telemedicine is really expensive. And how could we um, work with third-party payers and have this reimbursed as well so that we can sit in our clinic, but then reach out to you in the community. So the interventions as far as uh, what we would prescribe in rehabilitation uh, settings, are uh, they're vast. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can work on. So there's aerobic uh, training, strength training, uh, balance training. Balance training is something that I really emphasize the most and specialize in the most, but for whatever reason, I'm not uh, going to emphasize it too much, primarily because I can talk about it for hours and hours. So I'm just going to talk about some of the things that you'll see most often. Uh, the gait training, if your mobility is uh, limited, and then the stretching, uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more. I have three slides just on stretching and tone management because that can be something that's limiting in mobility, also causes a lot of pain too. And some of the recommendations I have in each one of these, aerobic strengthening and stretching and, and tone management I'll give today. But recommendations, again, you want to be seen by a, um, a specialist to make sure that you're doing it right. Additional approaches, obviously, are fairly endless as well. So aquatic therapy, uh, overall fatigue management. This is 
Um, if you have the neurological related fatigue, NMO related fatigue, that is more perception of fatigue, uh, lethargy that's related to that. Uh, there is some additional education in some of the how do we manage your daily routine is uh, a type of intervention as well. We always think about exercise being a treatment, but also um, fatigue management is a part of rehabilitation. Electrical stimulation, we would uh, usually categorize that as compensation, but it could be utilized for compensation for weakness to uh, improve mobility and walking, safety, but also pain management too uh, with some of the stimulation. If uh, their neurological pain is overwhelming, we can't get it at any other way. Some of the uh, stimulation can be therapeutic in covering up, in a way, um, the pain receptors coming back to the brain. So it just kind of covers it up a bit uh, for you with that neurological pain. And then other aspects of yoga and tai chi can be also uh, mind and body healthy. So in the rehabilitation setting, too, there might be the need for one-on-one -on -one work more than just prescribing an exercise program or programs for you to utilize in your uh, community and your um, daily routine. But also as uh, rehabilitation specialists, we might have to help you and facilitate that and help the brain and the muscles to begin to work together in a more coordinated fashion. This is what we call in rehab handling. So handling and facilitating exciting and or decreasing the hypertonicity or hyperactivity of the muscles so that we can get a bit more normal movement patterns. So the mode of delivery is usually manual, uh, manual techniques. So it's something that you can't do yourself. And even caregivers, it's really, really hard uh, to educate and train. It would have to be so, something done as a precursor so that maybe you can then advance into more advanced exercise program, something that you could do at home. And then some of the equipment too, of course, like I said, uh, facilitating would be electrical stimulation as well. Uh, gait and mobility compensations. So I have from basically lower level to higher level compensation listed here from top to bottom. So handheld assistive device could be anywhere from a walking stick, a cane, um, to a rolling walker, usually bilateral hands, unilateral hands, or two sticks at one time, can aid in safety as well as the efficiency and the energy expenditure that you have to put out to compensate for some of the weakness. Some of the spasticity can be helped with some of the four-limbed ambulation. Uh, the bracing, um, also something that I can uh, talk more specifically if it's something that you need currently or in the future. We have moved away, especially myself, uh, from prescribing the bigger, clunkier plastic polypropylene ones. We are moving into an era of uh, fairly um, higher tech uh, carbon fiber. Um, I have orthotists that I work with in the community that we're not just going with the off-the-shelf varieties. We're going with custom-made carbon fiber, but carbon fiber can be very brittle. It's very strong, but at the same time, there's a... There's no um, gray point as far as stress point. So as, as it starts to get stressed, if you're very active, it'll have a breaking point very, very soon. But what they do is they have learned a technique, and obviously it's proprietary for them, is that they've learned a way of actually intertwining the carbon fiber with a more flexible material, and it's fantastic. So the custom-made ones are very important, extremely lightweight, and very uh, uh, less cumbersome than a polypropylene full contact brace. So those are the ones to go to. Uh, wheelchair and motorized devices, of course, for compensation. Um, but we have to be careful about um, how early we um, administer this uh, recommendation. Uh, but as far as safety and energy conservation, so that maybe you can intertwine the use of a motorized device as, or uh, uh, a motorized device, wheelchair, scooter, and then be active in and or out of that device as well. Uh, transfer systems, if you are dependent on a caregiver, uh, we have to be mindful of how much stress that can put on a caregiver. If you need uh, uh, assistance for transfers to and from a commode, or daily transfers that we have to make sure that maybe there's some uh, compensation devices that could be used as well. Oops, I went backwards. And then, of course, I told you I would talk about education. If your therapist is not educating you in the clinic and just throwing out this is what you have to do, this is what you have to do, um, you might want to um, be more proactive and be an advocate for yourself. 
of asking the whys. Why am I doing this? And how can I do this effectively at home? And so a lot of education, not only about what we're prescribing, but to bring that to possible evidence, but then also to your desires and your goals and what you are having problems with and what it's going to help you with and relating that to NMO specifically. It has to come down to specifically you as the person and what your symptoms and your physical function limitations that we're targeting, tar trying to target is what we're going for. So that education is very important. Barriers, there's tons of barriers for all of us. And, you know, it's like I've got tons of excuses why I'm not doing X, Y, and Z. But if we can overcome some of the excuses, some of the actual barriers, and implement a daily routine for you, that's essential. And obviously education on symptom management and overall healthy lifestyle too, including what we'll talk about in the afternoon as well, uh, about uh, nutrition is very important. Um, overall, uh, things to consider when um, initiating an exercise program or rehabilitation process is uh, can we rely on your heart rate to actually determine the intensity? Because sometimes there might be a limitation of being able to get the heart rate up to match how much you're putting out. So that whole fatigue part could be something that we look at more in the exertion. I have a scale that you should be using from your rehabilitation specialist maybe sometimes instead of the heart rate, because usually it's like we have to get to a certain heart rate to get the effects of exercise. That's not always the case. And this uh, scale that I'm going to bring up is, has been actually validated in persons with MS, but can be uh, implemented for persons with an NMO to make sure that we are not over-exercising you and not under-exercising you so that it's what you feel while you're actually uh, doing the exercise. Heat intolerance, so thermal sensitivity, there are techniques. There are cooling vests. I'm not a big fan of cooling vests overall. Um, but then there's also the component of, you know, sometimes uh, we might not be able to get our sweat to be created because the way that we cool ourselves off, our core temperature gets cooled off, is that it's at the point of evaporation of the sweat off your body. So if you're not creating sweat because maybe you're not quite getting up to that level of creating actual sweat, um, we might have to create artificial sweat. A mister bottle with a fan while you're exercising creates the evaporation, and that to me um, mimics more natural uh, decrease of core temperature rather than putting a cooling vest on your body. My theory there is you put something cool on your body, what happens? The body tries to preserve organs. The actual temperature in the blood goes to the center, and it's really hard to dissipate core temperature. So try to create it more naturally. Uh, impaired bowel and bladder control. I'm not talking specifically on how to improve that, but there are therapists that specialize in that control, pelvic floor control. But I'm also thinking about con uh, considerations that knowing that you might need a bathroom uh, nearby when you are participating in exercise. Because whenever we talk about mobility, sometimes we talk about motility and the actual hyperactivity of the bladder too. So making sure that you have a, a restroom or the therapist that knows that you may need the rest, restroom more often. Uh, medication effects and side effects are always important to make sure that you know those and what's from that versus exercise uh, and back and forth and the overall equipment needs that you might need during participating in purposeful exercise. Just an overview of strength training uh, guidelines. I'm not going to get into specifics because it has to be very specific to you, very specific to what you're bringing to the table. And that cart before the horse, the, har the horse has to come. We have to determine what abilities each muscle groups might have and target each muscle group maybe a little bit differently. But there's one thing you'll see on your duration is at least maybe just one set. A set is a group of how many times you might do a particular exercise. And the repetitions is how many times you actually do the exercise. And I have it down as low as one repetition. One re if you can move the limb, if you can act, excite that muscle voluntarily by yourself, we're going to work it. We're going to work it in a specific way. We might have to facilitate it first and then bring it to a strength training exercise program. The intensities will vary. And I have on here look and feel. So this is where if you go right out into the community and you work with an exercise specialist, a fitness expert in the rec center or fitness center, um, they're not going to understand quite this concept. 
So if you're looking at one or two repetitions, you want those one or two repetitions to look and feel as good as that very first one. So if you're on your third repetition and you're not able to move that limb like you did on the first repetition, you already fatigued that muscle group. You already taxed it way too much, so it should look like it went through the full range like it did the first time, and it should feel like you just jumped up the intensity level by maybe one point. And that's all kind of, you're going to have to be very attentive to that and not think that yesterday I did 50 repetitions, now I should be able to do 50 repetitions today. It might be different from one day to the next, so the look and feel is essential. So the modes of exercise, usually we think about weights, handheld weights. We think about machines, possibly. Those are all definitely good modes of uh, ways of exercising and strength. Well, this doesn't really come up very well. But um, strap weights, Velcro weights are fantastic because you can do most of the essential movement patterns of the limbs, upper extremities and lower extremities, by having a simple set of these. Sometimes they come where you have one set, one set meaning two, and you can actually put in different levels of uh, resistance upwards from you know, half a, a half a pound weight to actually five pounds weight, and you work with your therapist to work on progressively resistive exercises over time, but the mode might be different for you, and this, is, this can be done easily at home. Um, some of the bands and some of those I have illustrated here with one of my students is that if you have hand weakness, it might be hard to hold on to a dumbbell. It might be hard to hold on to a cable set where you have to hold on and pull because the first thing that might fail are the small hand mu uh, muscles and not the big gross muscles. So then it's like, well, how do I get my big gross muscles to work and work them when I can't even hold on to the weight? Here is a way that we can strap it, we can loop it, and we can get it around passively so that you can then benefit from that and easily do it at home. So that's a mode of compensating for some of the weakness. And this is just an illustration too that my student here is working on that muscle that pulls the foot up, which is fairly uh, common in persons that have foot drop problems and not being able to get that foot through without tripping. And so the only way that I've seen to be able to actually work that is through bands because there's no machine that works that. And it's really hard to just put a weight on your foot and move up. So utilizing this as a counterbalance with their other foot, I use routinely. And I have uh, my patients bring in their, if they have smartphones, most of us do, um, they take their picture on their phone and then they, I no longer do stick figures. I can't draw, I can't write for nothing anymore. So they'll take a picture just like this. You have to take home and you can do this at home. And then other um, modes as well, a cable set if your hand strength is, is good. And also I have my student here doing it in sitting. There's in standing as well, but in sitting. So if you are utilizing a wheelchair or unable to ambulate, there is, I'll never stop exercising a person as long as they're able to at least sit up. Even if they're laying down, we can still exercise. So being able to sit in unsupported sitting, some of the rotational, what he's doing here is cable across. But what you have to do is if you're wheelchair, if you're in the wheelchair all day and you need, you need to utilize the wheelchair, you need to do a lot more unsupported sitting as much as possible. You need to make sure that you're at least utilizing your core for stabilization routinely over time. Because what happens is that we utilize the, the wheelchairs, uh, motorized uh, uh, devices, most often because legs are weak and we cannot walk, walk as much. As, as soon as we start seeing that, we start seeing a lot more creeping up into the trunk. Or maybe it starts at the trunk and then it goes down to the legs. But we have to make sure that you're not up against the wheelchair all day long and not doing at least even some arm raises unsupported. If you can move a limb, we're going to exercise it. And I'm just showing you different ways that we can do that with resistance. But sometimes we'll do this without resistance. I'll just have you utilize your arms for mobility and just that, I'm, I'm sorry, for, um, for uh, counterbalance. So that motion, you have to counterbalance that unsupported. And then maybe we work into something that's more progressive. And then overall endurance and uh, aerobic training is very important for heart and lung health. Um, obviously, so there's different ways of doing that. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics either, but as many as, uh, you know, seven days a week. As much as you can, uh, the American Heart Association, we usually fall back on the recommendations of moderate 
um, exercise, and that could be leisure, could be employment, could be prescribed exercise, what we talked about before, but it should be 30 to 45 minutes, but it doesn't have to be all at one time. It could be five, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 15 minutes in the evening, you're done. That should be something that should be done every day. And this is also for the general population, but that much more important if you have limitations due to NMO that is creating more immobility, we wanna make sure that you're doing as much exercise and just somewhat hard or somewhat uh, moderate for you. So the endurance exercises could be machine related, upper extremities and lower extremities as well. And then here's the rate of perceived exertion. So this could be a substitute for your heart as a monitoring of intensity, the rating of intensity or effort. Dr. Borg, long time ago, came up with the scale. Do not, I, I've never been able to ask him why he started with six and ended up with 20. So there's a modified version if you don't like that scale, it's zero to 10. Just like any other pain scale, I think that makes more sense actually. It's, it's certainly us Americans, it makes much more sense, zero to 10. Uh, muscle spasm, so very quickly, um, the, the effect of muscle spasm, spasticity, pain, um, it's uh, excited by quick motions. So even just by walking, there might be a quick motion or a quick stretch of the muscle. It's hyperactive, it's a reflex of the muscle. It's not voluntary, it's very involuntary, as you know. And then it can cause muscle fatigue. So um, it results, obviously, possibly in disrupted sleep. So I'll get into what I recommend for that. So um, the medication um, can be utilized for control of tone, uh, muscle spasms, but then also some of the um, side effects of uh, antispastic medications is overall fatigue as well because it's dampening the neurological system. So some of the uh, stretching guidelines, it's gonna be a longer stretch for that muscle group. And what I, um, I, I po uh, pointed out as far as like sleep, um, disrupting sleep, so if you get cramps at night, you wanna make sure that you're doing your stretch, and usually those uh, occur in the calf muscle. So I say before you crawl back in the bed, before you turn off that light, make sure you do a, the long stretch just before you go into bed, and sometimes that can actually last throughout the night and carry you throughout, and obviously sleep is always good for all of us. So benefits are quite unlimited, really. And it could be overall health, improvement in quality of life, mobility, prevention of other uh, uh, complicating diseases. And then one area that we're looking at too, is it possible cognitive and memory um, benefit as well? A very, very hot topic right now and something that hopefully we can solve too. So my daughters, Maya and Olivia, thank you as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna have the pleasure of talking to you about what we're doing in research in neuromyelitis optica. And then once I'm done, we'll have uh, each of the four presenters come up here. We can have a question and answer session. Uh, we'll have that opportunity in the afternoon as well. So if you have any questions for Dr. Hebert, uh, stay patient. Uh, you'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, send questions his way. When we look at NMO research, there are two different categories that I want to cover. One is research in the clinic, what we're bringing now to potentially care for patients in the future. And when it comes to new things in clinical research, the first thing I want to talk to you is how we're reclassifying this disease and why what that reclassification means in terms of potential uh, new diagnostic studies that may help us in determining 
uh, how to best take care of patients. And finally, what's on the horizon in terms of the excitement that now is there in the clinic that we are going to have the first treatment trials uh, starting up for neuromyelitis optica. As you know, there is no approved therapy for treating this disease. And there's no approved therapy because we haven't done any systematic studies to prove that what we do is overall beneficial. We have an inkling by looking at patients who were not being treated, who suddenly got treated, and you saw some of those graphs presented by Dr. Alvarez in his talk. A lot of dots of people having attacks, then we give them a medicine and we see less frequent dots of markings of attacks. But we don't have any systematic proof and a lot of those types of studies are prone to error. And so now we have the opportunity to treat patients and to uh, treat patients with active drug and uh, with placebo to determine whether we're really doing what we think we're doing to benefit patients. And with any medication, there's adverse events that you've heard about, as well as the benefit, which is less attacks. And does that balance come out in the favor of people being treated? So I'm going to talk to you about the drugs that are currently making it to clinical trials right now. And then we'll switch over to laboratory research. And in the laboratory, we have lots of things to do to try to understand this disease. My laboratory here at the University of Colorado, as well as many other labs around this country and the world, are working to try to understand what are the mechanisms that drive this disease. Those mechanisms and understanding them can help us develop more specific therapies and potentially cures. And then finally, what are biomarkers? Basically, by a biomarker, we mean what sort of information can we gather uh, from interrogating your body in some way, taking blood, taking urine, uh, analyzing those components, taking spinal fluid, looking at images that can tell us better about what your diagnosis is, what the future may hold, are you responding to therapy, are you not responding to therapy? Because as many of you may have known already, sometimes therapies don't work or what we think we're giving you to treat isn't going to work. And we'd like to know that before you have your next problem. So a biomarker is something that we don't have right now to say, aha, uh -huh, you know, here, pee in a cup, turns red, great, it's working. That's the best sort of biomarker we can think of. Right now, we don't have anything like that. And so what we want to do is to be able to move forward in that direction. Well. When it comes to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, as you heard, uh, Dr. DeVick first coined the phrase neuromyelitis optique in the late 1800s. And he did so because he compiled together the first group of cases of people who had optic nerve and spinal cord inflammation at the same time. Did he discover the disease? No, people have described things probably that are like neuromyelitis optica in the past. But he's the first one who published it together and he stuck his name on it because he was fairly proud of it and it became DeVick's disease. Now, following that, in 1999, Dean Wingerchuk and Brian Weinshaker at the Mayo Clinic put together some criteria to try to understand whether this disease, as we had hemmed and hawed about it, was related to multiple sclerosis or not. And in order not to presuppose that it was related to multiple sclerosis, they made up some criteria. They said, hey, you had to have optic neuritis, you had to have transverse myelitis, and we're going to make sure that nobody with MS fits into this diagnostic category right away. We're going to make sure you absolutely cannot have any signs of brainstem or brain disease, and that's going to be our criteria of neuromyelitis optica. And by the way, we're going to make it so strict that you have to have a coincidental involvement of your optic nerves and spinal cord, or at least if you don't, you've got to have them within two years of each other. And did they have proof that this was NMO? No, they just decided that was going to be what they described as NMO. And that way we could know definitively what we're looking at, and then we'll decide how these patients uh, 
look compared to patients with multiple sclerosis and other diseases. Well, it so happened that in 2004 that the group at the Mayo Clinic found this antibody that patients with NMO had that no other patients had. And what made this a fantastic boom was that because of its specificity that you've heard about, and this is the antibody against aquaporin-4, what's called aquaporin-4 IgG here, is that they were able to expand the criteria of diagnosis of NMO so that we could know because of this specificity that you could not only have optic neuritis and transverse myelitis, but even to prove that you had it, all you had to do was have this blood test that was very specific that said that you had this aquaporin-4 antibody. But it was still possible for you not to have it. As you can see, you needed two out of these three other criteria. You had to have a long spinal cord lesion, or they relaxed a little bit. And it's always good for people at the Mayo Clinic to relax a little bit. And what they did was they said, hey, once we see these patients who had this antibody, we noticed that they didn't really all have negative brain and brainstem involvement. In fact, 60% of them had something there that didn't look kosher. So now we're going to have you have, you're allowed to have it, but it just can't look like MS. And that became the criteria that all of you who are diagnosed with NMO get diagnosed by is this criteria here. And what was the great boon of finding this antibody is it was actually found absolutely accidental. They have a laboratory clinic up at the Mayo Clinic that gets blood samples sent all the time for what we call perineoplastic syndrome. Syndromes where the brain is involved by inflammation due to the body attacking a tumor somewhere in the body. And you can look for these antibodies and how they react to brain and make the diagnosis. So they get blood samples sent all the time. And they had a whole chest of blood samples that were negative for the tests that they do. The first test that they do is they throw the antibody on brain. And when you throw these antibodies on brain, you see this certain pattern that's shown here that's lighting up, in this case, a part of the brain called the cerebellum. Shows up better on the side projection. I don't know, something wrong with the green channel on this one. But what they found out is that, hey, we don't understand what this means, but let's look at the history of all the patients that were sent in that had this pattern. And they found out, hey, they don't sound anything like perineoplastic disease, but they sort of sound a lot like what we call neuromyelitis optica. And they went back and defined this study, and lo and behold, they were right. And they found out it was against aquaporin-4. Well, what was the problem with this criteria is that when someone has an attack of optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, and they had this antibody, we knew the antibody was so specific, but actually with a single attack, we couldn't diagnose you really with NMO. We would say to you, you have NMO spectrum disease, and what we meant was, wink, wink, you have NMO, you don't meet this criteria, but our understanding is that you don't behave any differently than somebody who's had both optic neuritis and transverse myelitis. And we don't want to be stupid and wait for you to have the next attack to prove it to us, but we're going to give you a different name for now. Well, what's happened in the past two years is through the auspicious help of the Guthy Jackson Foundation, a group of clinicians were brought together from around the world to invent new criteria for NMO based on our understanding that not only do you not need to have more than one event happen for us to feel secure to make a diagnosis, but we also understood, as you've heard already, that if you have this antibody, you can have a lot of other strange symptoms happen that can be very pathognomonic for this disease. And so we wanted to incorporate all that new knowledge so now we have a new diagnosis, and this is a chart here that shows that only about, at best, 75% of people with the disease have the antibody. So there's plenty of patients we have to diagnose without the antibody. That we have what is going to be called now NMO spectrum disease 
in the first place. So if someone says, now you don't have NMO, you have NMO spectrum disease, that's because of what the new criteria is laid out to be. And so there are basically two categories in NMO spectrum disease. You either have the antibody, that is, with aquaporin for IgG, or you don't. And if you do have the antibody, basically all you need is one event to happen in order to make the diagnosis. We still don't believe that someone lurking around that accidentally falls on a needle, someone hits the wrong test on an order sheet, and all of a sudden you come back with NMOIgG means that you have the disease. It certainly would raise an eyebrow, but we don't feel that there is a way of diagnosing someone purely by the fact that they have the antibody. But if you have one event, which is either optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or something else, and you've heard about some of those something else, and I'll go over it in a second, then you can have the diagnosis now if you test positive for the antibody, and that's all you need. We always put, because we're careful, exclusion of anything else, and if I showed you that, it's like the fine print disclaimer on anything else you'd buy when we talk to other clinicians. The exclusion of anything else is a long list, but it's a pretty short list to exclude when you're looking at those people who might just have a false positive antibody test. Now, if you don't have antibody present, and this is a group of about what we feel are 25% roughly of people who we can make the diagnosis on, then you have to have more than one event. And one of your events has to be a core event, what we would call optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or now, because it's so fairly specific for NMO, protracted nausea and vomiting. Dissemination in space is required, which means you can't have the same attack and the same thing all the time. That is, my right eye went out, my right eye went out again, my right eye went out again, and you still don't have antibodies present, sorry, you're out of luck, doesn't count as NMO. You have to have some other part of the body affected, and we need to have some extra evidence, such as a certain pattern on the MRI, the long spinal cord, or perhaps a certain pattern to MRI lesions in the brain to make us feel comfortable in making this test. And as emphasized before, we know that some patients, particularly children, will not be positive initially and may be positive as time goes on, that the antibody test is repeated often, especially in cases that are uncertain. So in this case, we have these two new categories for diagnosis. And when it comes to seronegatives, this is where classification is becoming important. Who are these people? Are they people that we just don't have the best test to check for this aquaporin-4 antibody? Or is it that there's some other targets other than the aquaporin-4 water channel that we're missing? Well, it just so happens that one of the fraction of patients, some of the fraction of patients who are antibody negative for aquaporin-4 have now been found to have antibodies against myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, which I'll call MOG, because we do it all the time in the laboratory, it's easier for me, and it's a lot easier to say than myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. So antibodies against MOG. Well, if you know a little history about multiple sclerosis, I would say MOG is the one protein that's been looking for a disease all its life. We've been able to test it, test antibodies against it for a long, long time because it's a major outer component of myelin covering the nerves. And we knew for a long time we could make mice sick if we make them have an immune reaction against it. And so there's been a long history of trying to talk about people with antibodies against this who have MS, who don't have MS. Well, it just so happens if you have a hammer and a new disease came along, we knew to check for this for a while. And it ends up that 20% of people with NMO have antibodies against MOG. And these are all people who have antibody negative NMO. So they meet that old clinical criteria for the disease. So we have to say you have it based on our own criteria, but they never have aquaporin-4 antibodies. These are only seronegative. So we're talking about of the 25% of a rare disease who don't have 
the antibodies, only 20% of them have this antibody. And it ends up now that these patients don't quite match everybody else. As I pointed out here, they tend to be younger. That high bias towards women tends to be reduced. They tend to have simultaneous optic nerve and spinal cord involvement at the same time. They more frequently involve the lower part of the cord, the conus. They have better recovery and they have less chance that they'll ever have another attack in their life. So, why does this become useful? I think at this point, not because it's probably another cause. We have a lot of more work to do, and in fact, my laboratory and another laboratory in England published a paper that if we try to cause the same damage that we know we can cause with the aquaporin-4 antibody, with this antibody, it isn't up to snuff. Okay. They like, that is my colleague likes to say, that's great because it shows why you don't you recover better. My point is, it shows why it's not the same disease. Okay. It just so happens that it could be that this antibody is associated with a group of disorders, whether or not it's involved in causing it, that mimic the signs and symptoms of NMO. Just like NMO mimic the signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis, why we thought it was related for so long. But because these patients behave so differently, in particular because they don't relapse as often, it is now, I think, going to become an important marker that we check on patients who don't have the aquaporin-4 antibody, because if you do, it may be a good indication that you don't need to start therapy yet because it's unlikely that you're going to have another attack. And it means that we can perhaps wait a little bit before becoming very aggressive when you have an attack because you're more likely to recover on your own without us doing a more dangerous intervention. So these sorts of classifications are underway. My laboratory is doing a lot of work because we were able to clone the first antibodies to prove that this antibody against aquaporin-4 causes these, we're using the same techniques to try to find whether antibodies in seronegative patients can cause things that look like NMO. So we can have other things to say, is that whole 25% that's not aquaporin-4 positive, do they really have NMO or are they lookalikes? And if so, if we know how they behave and how they respond to therapies, we can better treat them. When we look at emerging therapies, and this always screws up here, I apologize. I should have checked it before it went on the PC. It's from the Macintosh, screws it up. We have a lot of different approaches to start from the production of antibody that enters the central nervous system, that binds to astrocytes that are expressing the aquaporin-4 water channel, that causes the activation of the body's immune repertoire to destroy this astrocyte, that then subsequently leads to the death of myelin-producing cells, the oligodendrocyte, the subsequent injury to neurons, and then disability, and calls in other troops. We have many different ways to try to intervene in this process. One of the newest two ways that I'm going to talk to you about, because they're reaching clinical trials, are to inhibit the communication of a cytokine interleukin-6 with its receptor, and to destroy cells that bear the CD19 marker, and I'll talk about that in a second, as well as potentially uh, to interfere with the complement cascade by blocking the activation of complement, which is one of the key mechanisms by which that aquaporin-4 antibody starts the destruction of the astrocyte within the central nervous system. And finally, I'll talk about some experimental therapies, one of which was developed in our laboratory, that are meant to be non-immune suppressive. You talked about we treat you by suppressing your entire immune system. Now we're going to try to treat you by blocking the exact cause of the disease without bothering to treat your immune system. Let it be there and hopefully uh, do its job in terms of preventing you from infection. 
So when we talk about causes of NMO, we go back to the beginning, we're still uncertain about what it is that might eventually bring out this disease. We have three different considerations. We know that the target in most cases is the aquaporin-4 water channel, and we know that in the days that you live, you're fighting off foreign invaders all the time, and particularly bacterium, and you live with bacterium inside your body. And we think that autoimmune disease in many individuals arises because of the fact that some of these things that we fight off look like some of the things inside of us, and that mimicry allows the immune system to get confused and start fighting itself. Perhaps it could be a chronic infection. We don't know, but it doesn't seem like that. Or sometimes, as mentioned before, attacks can happen after an infection. And we call that bystander activation. It means the whole immune system gets thrown up in arms to fight off the foreign invaded. And by the way, that includes some people who we really didn't mean to invite to the party. And they're the ones that might be targeted against your own aquaporin 4. One of the interesting things that we found so far has been in this case of molecular mimicry, Scott Zanville's lab at University of California, San Francisco, found that T cells that are reactive against aquaporin 4 are targeted against aquaporin 4 in people because they recognize a piece of that protein that is specific uh, to this protein only, aquaporin 4. And this aquaporin 4 sequence here that they found that a lot of T cells in affected individuals were reacting to looked a lot like the sequence in this protein that's found on this bacterium called Clostridium fringens. It causes gas gangrene if you actually have a bad infection, but we have a lot of Clostridium bacteria inside of us, part of our normal gut flora. And so it becomes a possibility that people who otherwise have a certain marker which determines what pieces of each thing around us that the immune system is going to present and has a reaction against clostridium in your gut may be making people susceptible to developing this disease. It may be the link between environment and immune susceptibility that can explain why some people get this rare disease. It also indirectly, but in no proven way, might suggest why Things that we talk about like gut macrobiotics and adjusting the gut flora may ultimately have benefit in immune diseases, especially if we find out true culprits, we can know perhaps modifying what's inside of us can make a difference on how susceptible our body is to react against uh, new stimuli. In terms of new treatment coming to the clinic, one of the ways uh, that we may be fighting NMO in the future is with anti-complement therapies. And there is currently an active clinical trial going on using echolizumab, a drug approved for the treatment of a rare disorder. If you think of rare disorders, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, okay? Brief events where at night you destroy your own blood cells is basically the translation, is a rare disorder which would make NMO seem like an epidemic. Okay. This drug is a good treatment and the only treatment for that orphan, orphan disease. And for PNH patients, it has made echolizumab the most expensive therapy in the entire world. It's about $400,000 a year. But because complement is involved in the destruction of astrocytes in NMO, echolizumab is a potential therapy. And in fact, what we look at is that the activation of complement is a key part of how eventually this terminal complex called C5B9 or MAC is formed. And once MAC is deposited on a cell, it's good night. Okay? And so if an antibody lands on a cell and says this is a target that doesn't belong here, the complement system can be activated. It goes down this cascade of various protein components being activated. And then finally, MAC is deposited and the cell is dead in the water. What anti-C5 antibody does is at this linchpin, 
and complement can be activated along three pathways. At this pathway that they all converge on, this antibody binds to C5 and prevents it from being cleaved and activating that MAC component. And what has happened in preliminary studies, looking at 14 NMO patients sponsored by the Mayo Clinic, they looked at 14 highly active patients. So these patients had to have two relapses in the past six months or three attacks in the past year. And they were either, they were loaded on echolizumab, but there wasn't anybody who wasn't treated or treated with something else. So we have no comparison. And what they found out was out of the, four, out of the 14 patients, only two of them had a subsequent attack over the next year. And that's a significant reduction in the relapse rate. Unfortunately, we don't have a comparison, and we know from doing many clinical studies, if you have a lot of attacks, usually, no matter what you do, which is unusual to have that many attacks, you usually have less frequent attacks in the future. And so there's always this regression that you have to account for. You don't know whether they would have responded to other medications, but this is very promising. And what they found out was that the people who did have disability, it improved. Their vision and their ambulation improved when they were treated with the medication. And this is an every two-week IV infusion. It's not highly convenient because the problem is your body makes a hell of a lot of complement every day. And so you have to give a hell of a lot of antibody to bind to all of that complement every two weeks. Now the problem also is is that there are risks for inhibiting complement. Complement does a lot of good things for you. And so one of the things it does is it keeps bacteria out of the places it shouldn't be. And there's a big risk on this therapy to have meningitis, particularly meningococcal meningitis. So everyone who was in this trial got vaccinated against meningococcus, but still one person had meningitis despite vaccination on this therapy. So right now, this therapy is beginning clinical trials, but you have to have a lot of attacks to qualify for this trial. Uh, and that's because their output is to have patients who are on therapy who then switch to having echolizumab added or nothing added, and they look at reduction in that attack frequency. Okay? So this is a trial for very active patients coming up. New immune therapies, anti-IL-6. Interleukin-6, we know, is a cytokine messenger that's very high in NMO patients. This is a graph showing you that in NMO patients or in patients with transverse myelitis, in the spinal fluid, there's tremendous amounts of IL-6 present compared to people like here with multiple sclerosis. And if we look at how much IL-6 message you have in your spinal fluid, and compare it to how much of the antibody against aquaporin-4 you have, the more you have of one, the more you tend to have of the other. In addition, IL-6 does things we don't want to have happen in NMO, so it makes sense that it might be involved in producing disease, one of which is it stimulates antibody-producing cells to make more antibodies. We don't want that aquaporin-4 antibody around, so we don't want to have that IL-6 around. And tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor, so it blocks the receptor from receiving the signal from IL-6. In one of those relapse graphs shown here in seven patients with NMO who were refractory to other therapies, relapses are marked by the solid uh, black line here. They get significant reduction in their relapses compared to one before they got the medicine. These arrows mean how many times they're getting the treatment of tocilizumab. So this is a frequent injection. Well, what you've heard about is that this is coming to the clinic. This is SA237 code name, okay? Tocilizumab is coded SA237 because it's a souped up version of tocilizumab. Why do we want it souped up? Because it's got extra bells and whistles that make it last longer. We have to give it less frequently. And for every dose, it has more effect on the IL-6 receptor. Why else do people want to give souped-up versions? Because it means a new patent and it lasts longer for 
revenue generation too. But not that that's all bad. We want these things to have the best possible effect. And tocilizumab is now in a clinical trial for NMO patients. We are one of the centers doing this trial. So in patients who have recent relapse activity, they have to have one relapse in the past three years, you can be eligible to receive this treatment. There's a two to one ratio of enrollment to treatment to placebo. So of all the other new drugs I'm gonna to talk to you about, we are doing placebo controlled trials in NMO. What does that mean? That means you have a risk that you could get nothing. And why this is important is, number one, because we don't have proof that what we do works. The second issue is we don't have proof that what we do has benefit over side effects. And third and most importantly, we can't get a drug approved in the United States for the treatment of NMO according to the FDA unless we do a trial against placebo. And so it doesn't do us any good to get a drug approved or do a study that the FDA won't give its branded stamp and say this is a proven therapy for NMO because then insurance companies don't have to pay for it. Okay? And so that's the process of drug therapy approval. What we try to do is minimize risk. We give more patients drug than are eligible for placebo and we limit the window that they're exposed to placebo. In this trial, everyone will either get drug or placebo for a year, and that's it. Then everybody goes to active drug. In the other trial for another medication, which ends up being anti-CD19, that window is only six months. Why do we want to use anti-CD19? How many of you are on rituxan? That's anti-CD20. That's another marker on B cells. And anti-CD19 is another way of killing B cells. But CD19 is on more B cells than CD20 is, and particularly B cells that produce antibodies. So anti-CD19, or MEDI551 is the code, depletes B cells similar to rituximab, but it also reduces or can eliminate the levels of aquaporin for IgG, which you may think has a big link to starting relapses. And so this is another placebo-controlled trial that we'll be doing here at the university. Again, we'll have enrollment criteria that demand some reactivity within the past year. So you have to have a relapse within one year to be eligible for this. In this trial, again, it's going to be drug versus placebo. And the time that people are on placebo is only six months. After that, everyone goes to drug. And what we're looking at is what is the time that it takes for someone to break through their therapy? And is it better if you're on drug? Is it better if you're on uh, placebo? We don't know. In the laboratory, we're looking for biomarkers of disease, something to tell us how your treatment or disease might progress, and what are the mechanisms? How can we develop new therapies? This is what I think about in the lab. So when I'm not in clinic thinking about you and I have to come back and think about the lab, this is how I think about NMO. Okay? I think that, gee, there's antibodies that are binding to aquaporin-4 on astrocytes. This is activating complement that we talked about. It's recruiting other bad players into the nervous system. This cell is being destroyed. Somehow it's getting this cell destroyed, who's its neighbor, but doesn't express aquaporin-4 and then ultimately neurons get destroyed, and how can I tie up this whole process into one simple explanation and best interfere with this process? When I think about aquaporin-4, I don't think about that cartoon. I actually think about this cartoon. This is aquaporin-4 and how it really exists in all its twists and turns of a protein. And we have had the opportunity to map out the exact targets of how antibodies recognize aquaporin-4 that are being made in your body. And we've isolated it down that there's two patterns of antibodies that are being made uh, by each person with NMO. And we've looked hard to say, hey, this could be a clue. Maybe it explains why all of 
the patients who have high levels of antibody, some of them don't have that attack, some of them do. Why doesn't it exactly follow the level of antibody? Why don't we check your antibody every time you come to the clinic? Because there's no obvious correlation between your antibody level and whether you're gonna have an attack. But if there's different kinds of antibodies, perhaps that would give us a clue. Well, I hate to say this part hasn't panned out yet, okay? Whether you recognize one pattern of targets on the surface, which is this group right together here, or whether you measure another target, which is this part right here, it kills cells just as good no matter what. But what we did find recently is a subgroup of antibodies right here. And if you look at these numbers, these numbers tell you how good the antibody binds to the target. A big number means it binds crappy, a small number means it binds good. And if it binds well, it kills the cell, and this is the course of the cell death based on the concentration of antibody. And here you can see that for the most part, if you have an antibody that binds 10 times as good as another antibody, it kills 10 times as good. As over here, this one binds twice as good as this antibody, black to black, and it curves, it kills about twice as good. What fascinated us is we found a group of antibodies that really don't bind too well, but kill great. And they end up binding to a very unique target on the aquaporin-4 molecule. And we're hoping now that if we can figure out a way, and we think we have, to tell how much of this particular antibody is in your mix of antibodies, we can know how bad an attack might be once it happens. That is, is it something we have to be really aggressive about? Because one thing we figured out by knowing these patterns is that even though you seem quiet, your group of antibodies is changing over time. Your body's been busy making new ones, getting rid of old ones, and so you aren't the same person with regard to antibodies that you were a year ago. And so if we checked you once and said, hey, you don't have any really bad antibodies, we need to check you in a year to say, hey, are you starting making bad ones now? Is it something we can use to help predict things? And so assays like this may be coming down the pipe. What can we use this for? We can also use it to help us figure out if we have antibodies that really kill really good, we can figure out how they bind to complement. And if they bind in a different way, we can start to make new inhibitors that particularly target that sort of interaction. And we can use the body's own mechanisms for blocking complement, because the body doesn't want to be killed and there's plenty of complement hanging around. It has ways of blocking that activation on its own. One of the other things we've done in the lab is figure out that for all the talk that we have of complement, there's other ways that antibodies can hurt cells. And one of these other ways is to use other cells in your body to recognize the bound antibodies, and then these cells go ahead and kill the target cell. This is a graph showing you that if we inject into a mouse brain antibody from patients with complement, we can cause lesions, as shown by the big blackness within the white hole there. If we just add cells, we can do the same thing. We can cause the same amount of damage. And why that's important is that we have inhibitors for these cells as well. And so Civellostat, which is an inhibitor of neutrophils, as well as intravenous immunoglobulin, may be new therapies that we can offer during attacks to limit the amount of damage and perhaps prevent future attacks. So IVIG may be an avenue that becomes more popular in terms of treating patients. We also know that other players are bad, in particular, neutrophils and eosinophils. Dr. Alvarez mentioned those red cells, which are eosinophils, that can uh, bind to uh, targets in the central nervous system and cause damage. They're very specific to NMO. Well, in NMO models, we know that if we add neutrophils or add eosinophils, we cause more damage. And they can do it by binding to the antibodies that are binding to aquaporin-4, and they can do it through complement, and they can do it independent of complement. What's important about this is Zyrtec, something you may have bought or used for other reasons, is an inhibitor of 
eosinophils. So if you have allergies and you need to take an antihistamine, take some Zyrta, <laughs> okay? It can't do you any worse, and we can't prove it yet. There are some trials going on. It may do you some benefit, okay? So all of these studies even may allow us to repurpose over-the-counter drugs that are already on the scene. Finally, there are even fancier ways. And Alan Berkman and his group have looked at the pattern of sugars that are put on antibodies. And the aquaporin-4 antibody is just one of those antibodies that has sugar residues put on it. Well, there are enzymes you can expose the antibodies to that clip off these sugar residues. And if you clip them off from your aquaporin-4 antibodies that are causing all this trouble, they can't do their bad job anymore. The question is, how do we get them out of your body, treat them this way, and then give your body's antibodies back to you? So that's the one trick in it, but there may be special techniques that we can take your own antibodies out, make them dysfunctional, and give it back to you as a treatment to compete with the bad antibodies that are being made. <coughs> one other way that I mentioned is that we have taken antibody from a patient that binds to aquaporin-4, so designed by a patient. We've neutered it, so to speak, so it can't activate complement, it can't bind to other cells and cause damage. And we've proven that if we can give it back, this antibody now becomes a therapy to block the bad antibodies. So this would be a non-immunosuppressive way to treat. And this antibody is in further development down in the future to have a non-immunosuppressive way to fight uh, this disease. And finally, you can try to block antibodies with small molecules. And so we've used the antibodies that we've taken out of patients, put them on a dish, and tried to look at all compounds that we can under the sun to see which ones bind. We found three compounds so far that can inhibit this process. None of them are ideally druggable, but this sort of small molecule search is another way to find a specific therapy that can block the assault that we think begins with antibody binding to target aquaporin-4 in the nervous system. So before I end, I want to let you know that there are people behind me that do all the work, okay? And these are people in my laboratory and colleagues around the country, particularly in Alan Berkman's laboratory at UCSF, who uh, work hard, who are working hard right now to process your blood as well. Uh, Greg Owens, Alana Ritchie, Hannah Schumann, Marcus Kararik, some John Solstice, some research I haven't even shown you yet. And of course, none of this research gets done without funding. And we've had generous funding from the Guthrie Jackson Charitable Foundation, as well as the National Institutes of Health who have recognized this as a rare and interesting disease to uh, further study uh, to help do the, all of this. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And we'll have a little uh, question and answer session uh, to lead us up before lunch. So again, thanks. Okay. Same rules apply as before. You've got cards, you've got hands. Either one works. And uh, we'll start there in the back. So thank you for all of your research and all of your work. Um, I was I just want to sit down. And what I found in this research um, of Chinese medicine is that the oleosendrites are actually helped being rejuvenated um, through electrostimulation of the spinal cord. And I stand here today as somebody who had a demyelinated spinal cord from C2 to T12 and who is completely regenerated today, and actually that happened in 13 months. And one of the notable things that I did different than a lot of other people that I saw was actually use some of these alternative modalities. So what my question is, is while you're doing the scientific studies, and 
I was on Rituxin for several years and now actually have been off it for two in, in full remission, so that's super exciting. Um, but what my question is, is in your clinic, um, both, and I worked with Jeff also as, for physical therapy, and that was super helpful, and he had a massage therapist, but what I'm curious is if, as you're treating patients, and we're looking at the well-being of overall life, if in clinic, if there's anything that you guys are looking at just outside of the blood, but also to incorporate some other modalities that might actually really be helpful in people regenerating and remyelinating. So I'm just curious if you guys have looked into that. Well, one of the things that you bring up that uh, we didn't have the time for in the limited is you know reparative uh, therapies, and that's a, a big issue in terms of any demyelinating disorder, whether it's neuromyelitis optica or multiple sclerosis. We understand that uh, the uh, oligodendrocytes that make the myelin are dying for different reasons in these two disorders, uh, but repairing them uh, may require similar efforts and it may require different efforts. In fact, uh, one of our chairmen of uh, cell and molecular biology here, uh, Wendy Macklin, is one of the experts in myelin biology, and we have a, a grant from the National uh, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation to study the interaction between astrocytes and oligodendrocytes and microglia, all the other components of the nervous system besides the neurons, to try to figure out what the mechanism is that these cells use to communicate each other, how to best approach that for repair. And right now, we don't have any proven therapies for repair, either in MS and NMO. There have been many uh, touted, either from laboratory work, where people can stimulate uh, electrical fields, or whether they can add various uh, compounds, uh, even some uh, a simple a small molecule compounds to help oligodendrocytes uh, rewrap and regrow, uh, but none of them that have been uh, either proven in human beings to work in which it's not just that these cells are dysfunctional, they need to regrow, they need to migrate in to target the right cell, they need to wrap that cell up completely, and then they need to transmit and insulate appropriately and all those steps in an organism are different than what we can do uh, in the body and why uh, you know, the clinical trials are necessary to show it. But when it comes to you know, recommending things, uh, if people bring it up, I know from my choice in clinic, if I don't feel it's harmful, such as injecting stem cells that someone purifies in a laboratory into your brain to rewrap your nervous system, which can lead to tumors and other problems, uh, no, I don't recommend that. If it's something that someone wants to uh, provide, such as an electrical stimulation unit, I advise people that it's their money. And by the, my reading of the research, unfortunately right now there's no proof that it works in a group of patients who are carefully studied and controlled, but I don't think it's harmful. And if it does you good, uh, great. It'll never be certain whether your body couldn't do it on its own because we don't have these studies. But I think at this point, because of our lack of knowledge, uh, it's uh, necessary to have uh, some semblance of uh, scientific rigor in what we expose patients to. Uh, but certainly, I appreciate that you know acupuncture, acupressure, other non-complement, non-traditional complementary medicines uh, may have some benefits, but. Uh, that's my approach. I'll leave it to say what you recommend over here. Yeah, I agree. I've had uh, many anecdotal reports from patients of benefits with different therapies, and I think that's fantastic. Obviously, I want my patients to feel better. Um, but the linchpin is really, is there any potential harm that's going to come from that therapy? Because right now, we just don't know enough to recommend one thing or another. It hasn't been studied in the way that we like to study things, by randomizing people and putting them on placebo and following these people forward to see who was going to get better anyway, who got like way, way better with the intervention that we provided. So we just don't have that data yet, but I know there's a lot of report of anecdotal benefit with some of these. I would just add also that I think that a lot of times there's a lot of options available, and, and 
how much information is available on each one of them is always kind of limited. So, I mean, we, we talk about adding Zantac, I, there's some literature about vitamin D, so adding acupuncture. So it becomes very easy to all of a sudden start adding you know, a list of 10, 20 different uh, supplements that might have an effect, uh, spend your time sort of in massage therapy, acupuncture, and all these other things. And, and it's, I think, a hard balance between how much can we get that paid for since very little of that's covered uh, in clinic and time to cover that. And so you, you want things that are that have some suggestion that they're beneficial, and I think if, if people find it beneficial, then it's great for them. Of course I'm getting so busy. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for, obviously, your questions and specifically bringing up a follow-up question about uh, neuromuscular uh, electrical stim, central nervous system stimulation, because not all electrical stimulation is created equal, and we use them in different ways, and we don't know the direct effect on the central nervous system it itself. You know, is it possible remodeling? We have no idea at this point. So there is peripheral uh, electrical stimulation that you would put on the skin that would possibly initiate some uh, reaction to that stimulus. But that doesn't happen for everybody. So just like medication, medication doesn't help for everybody. Um, electrical stimulation may or may not help for you, but we may try that. There's also some of what we call a transcranial electrical stimulation. That is a, uh, obviously cranial will be the head. Um, and that's uh, looking at the central drive, thinking that the weakness is, is coming from the inability to drive that from the neurological system to create a muscle action. So it, it's very possible that that research and that application could be beneficial because it's stimulating centers of the, of the brain that might not be able to initiate that contraction. Um, secondarily or tertiary, um, my colleague and myself up in Boulder, we're actually now just starting an NIH-sponsored uh, study on looking at different wavelengths of peripheral neurological, uh, of peripheral uh, neuromuscular stimulation and just seeing if different wavelengths and different deliveries and different type of uh, stimulation, direct versus alternative, uh, all or alternate stimulation might be beneficial. So we're just at the really the, the tip of the iceberg on looking at what could be beneficial as far as electrical stimulation goes and what does it does. Does it do anything to the neuro neurological system for as, as far as like remodeling or changing the actual system itself? Did, did any of that answer your, some of your questions? Yeah, I'm just... Uh... I guess I'm, I'm also trying to bring it up for people in this room as somebody who's actually lived through the neuromyelitis optica process and bring up additional modalities that I feel that are really outside of the scientific scope and things that in my life and that in my recovery, in my own very personal experience, have been tremendously helpful. Like when I was doing physical therapy with you, Jeff, which was amazing, and I really appreciate what you brought to my life, because I feel that physical therapy and the movement and the balance that you helped me with was amazing. In addition to that, though, after my physical therapy, oftentimes I would go use acupuncture. And what that would do to my body and what it would help, how it would help me recuperate and recover was significantly different than when I didn't. You know, other things are, are nutrition, and I know that's coming later. But I feel that while it's really important to look at scientific, and I'm really thankful for, you know, for instance, I was only the 37th person to get Rituxin for NMO when I was first treated, and nothing else worked. So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm also thankful that I went a step beyond just the science and actually looked for alternative things, because chemotherapy for the rest of my life doesn't seem like a real reasonable option. And so now, you know, with Dr. Corboy's support, I've been off with the Rituxin for two years and have been in full remission. And I really feel that some of these alternate modalities, and, you know, Dr. Bennett, you just said, well, we can't prove a lot of what we're saying. So I don't know if I can necessarily prove exactly what I'm saying. And I totally respect the fact that you guys want the studies to also sh show what works. But I just really want to encourage everybody in here to look outside of just the science and to really find it within themselves to believe in the hope and the body's ability to heal because we can do it. I regenerated a spinal cord from C2 to T12, totally remyelinated in 13 months. 
So it is possible. And I guess I just wanted to see how you guys felt about additional modalities and how that worked. And also just share with people from my own personal experience with this that there are other ways and to implement along with the Western treatments that can be really, really beneficial. So, thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> We've got a microphone <laughs> coming your way, so don't worry. Um, I have yeah. questions about clinical at all. It's me or you? Yeah. Mine is not clinical at all. Probably a lot of us now have our brains blown. So. <laughs> <laughs> but this, uh, my question is, when someone asks you what you have, and you say, give me a bubble, and they look at you like you, know, you came from Mars or something, <laughs> how, what is a very simple element way to explain it. That's question number one. The second one is, is there a support group anywhere in the Denver area for any of our patients? Um, if not, is there somewhere to start? Okay. Well, I think that second question I'll leave uh, for uh, Jacinta and Lisa who are up next with regard to advocacy and making uh, help you out with the uh, support group issue. Um, and I don't want to step on anybody's uh, toes on that. With regard to the first, my personal view, and uh, others can chime in, is that the best way to, to stay is that neuromyelitis optica is an inflammatory inflammation disorder of the body that attacks primarily the optic nerves and spinal cord. It comes and goes in waves, and you know, we're trying to uh, prevent those waves of attack from happening so that, you know, without them, we don't expect damage to uh, happen to the body. I, I tend to work a lot with analogies, and I think it's basically something where I, a lot of times I bring in, since people are a little bit more familiar with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or things like this, and basically say it's a condition like those in which instead of attacking the joints or other parts of the body, it's the eyes and the spine. More questions? We've talked about doing a lot of like physical activity for people that affected the spinal cord, but are there any suggestions for people who fully affected the eyes only? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the ability to exercise your vision back um, in terms of stimulation or uh, eliciting new function from uh, damaged uh, ganglion cells, which are the cells that, whose projections compose the optic nerve. What we have available to us, uh, sort of akin to physical therapy, is what we call low vision or a vision rehabilitation therapy. And so what those physicians are at the Rocky Mountain Lions Eye Institute, we have some, there are some out in the community, is uh, physicians who can give you the aids, the facilities, uh, the equipment to use what you have to the best extent possible. Right now there's a lot of people working at vision rehabilitation, in particular in terms of the scientific realm to how do we regenerate uh, these optic nerve cells, and unfortunately, it's not as easy as you know finding stem cells and giving them back to you in the eye. Because the first thing we found out is when we give those cells back, they don't want to send out cables back to the brain anymore, and we have to figure out different conditions to get them to do that. Then we have to trick them to turn and twist in the right direction to make the right connections. But you know, I do think it's feasible. I'm looking at it, you know, as a 10, 15 year project down the line in terms of uh, the scientific movement of the National Eye Institute, but unfortunately not there yet. Right now, the best thing to say is for uh, low vision and vision uh, rehabilitation. Now, I would just say on that is living a healthy and more active lifestyle can't hurt. Mm -hmm. So, nothing directly, but just having a healthy body is. Good. Um, yeah, Jacinta. 
Okay, so we're going to break for lunch first, and then we'll come back with the uh, uh, advocacy, nutrition, uh, disability, and everything else uh, after lunch. So go ahead and grab some lunch out there and enjoy. Thank you.